have my email, which is um, will be in the center very soon. So it's been also circulated. If there's any appointment you need to make, by all means, by you can drop me a line. Inshallah, that we can see and discuss many things. Alhamdulillah, I'm working with the ISO brothers and sisters very closely, and with some of the staffs also, to make sure we improve our services and facilities that we have at the center. And hopefully, inshallah, ta'ala, my first aim is to make sure we have a better building than the current one that we have, inshallah. So I need your du'as and your choice for that, inshallah, ta'ala. And jazakallah khairan for attending today. Inshallah, I hope Dr. Uthman uh, will be able to enlighten us with his beautiful words, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, shakirin, wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It is uh, really wonderful being in the company of such uh, esteemed guests as, as all of you um, I, I want all of us to think a lot today inshallah and think deeply about position, space and place and, and where we are as human beings uh, It is very interesting entering into a new space a new place, a new position, like all of you, perhaps some of you guys are just coming in for your first year, others are returning after your second, after your second year or third year, coming back for further studies in this university. But if you think about what it means in, in the discourse of spatial identities, we think about spaces of here, there and elsewhere. And this is something Allah in the Quran really uh, goes into a lot for us to understand what does it mean when you navigate through spaces as a human being for us of course as Muslims what does it mean for us to move through spaces let us think about the great prophet of Allah Sulaiman and of course Sulaiman was a king prophet Sulaiman is revered by both Jews Christians and Muslims and Allah in the Quran gives us a very interesting example of what it means to enter into new spaces and what is a mindset of a human being of a Muslim in this case when we uh, emerge into new spaces and see new people have new beginnings. In, this, in these few verses in Surah Surah Number in the Quran, Surah about the ants, Allah in the Quran says that uh, Allah says that gathered before Sulaiman were an assembly of humans, jinn and birds and they're all arranged. So try and picture therefore in your minds the scene. What does it remind you of? You think of power, you think of might, civilization, you think of kingdom. This is Suleiman, the great prophet Suleiman salam. And Allah is saying not hashara, not like he assembled, not that he gathered this uh, army of humans, jinn and birds, but it was gathered before him. It means therefore he's kind of passive mm -hmm. in this sense. It's like he's just, he's the king and he's observing this amazing scene of power. His humans, jinn and birds, and they're all arranged. There are three times in the Quran Allah uses that expression, فَهُمْ يُوزَعُونَ Now two times out of the three, Allah is speaking about the Day of Judgment. But this time Allah is not. Allah is speaking about the human, jinn and birds, and they're all arranged. Now that's like a place that you're comfortable with. That's like your space of hair. A hair space is a place that you're all familiar with. It's like your home, your bedroom. It's like you know, your garden, it's like where you're used to because you're just comfortable there. But we don't always live in spaces that we're comfortable with. We don't always associate in crowds and people that we're all familiar with. We don't always occupy spaces that we're all familiar with, where we move through space. Maybe therefore when you enter university, it's like a new space, new beginning, new buildings, and what do you do, and how do I behave, and what is the kind of the, the social conventions relevant for this space. Allah then says in the next verse, Hatta ida ato ala wadin naml, until they enter the valley of the ants. Now the valley of the ants, of course, isn't like a space that Suleiman is familiar with. It is no longer the, the, the positioning of humans and jinn and birds and they're all arranged because it's a new space, a new place. And it's a valley, so therefore it's under, it's low. If it's a valley, that means it's a, it's a lower place. And it's a valley of who? It's a valley of ants. And ants are like minuscule and tiny. You can hardly see and observe them. But it's interesting because the surah is called the surah An-Naml, the surah of the ants or the ants. So here we have them. This is the anecdote. This is the, the example about the ants after which or under which the, the surah itself was named An-Naml. So Allah says they enter the valley of the ants and then the female ant. Until the female ant speaks 
and says, O oh, ants, enter your homes. Suleiman. You don't want Suleiman and his army to crush you while they don't perceive that they're going to crush you. So what's happening, therefore, in this whole discourse? What's happening in the scene, in the image of Suleiman al Islam going from a space where he is familiar with, he understands, he occupies, it's all recognizability. We have human codes of recognizability. We, he, he can understand who's there. It's human, jinn and bird and all arranged and that's his army. But then he's moving through space and enters into a new space. But this time it belongs to the ants. It's the ants' place. There were people already there before Suleiman and his army of humans in beds entered, and that's the ant's place. And when he's about to enter, the female ant is afraid and says, O oh, ants, enter your homes. It's interesting, Allah used the word masakinakum, meskin, sakan. The, the second is a home as opposed to a house. So if you think about the dynamics of, of living spaces, you know, a house could be a, a, like a four building, four building place. Uh, made up of four walls, but it doesn't make the house a home until there is in that place an embodiment of warmth and love and empathy and trust and safety security. Like that's Sakin, like the verse about marriage in Islam in Surah Al Rum, Wamin Ayatihi and Khalaqalakum min and Fusikum Azwajali Tiskunu ilayha and from the signs of Allah, Allah has created for you your mates, partners. For you, from you, lakum min and fusikum. For you, from you. There's already a sense of conjoining in the verse, even before Allah details what that means. But Allah says, for the purpose, litaskunu ilayya, so you would find peace, tranquility, repose in them. That's the same word, sakina, sakan. The Prophet says, if one of you is, is going to the masjid and he hears even the iqama being called, he says, don't run. وَعَلَيْكُمُ sakina And for you to, to be, at, be in a state of peace when you're in the prayer. Let you be in a state of peace and ease in the prayer. And so Allah therefore is saying that the female ant, the queen ant is saying, O oh, ants, enter your homes as opposed to a house. That means even that the ants have places where they feel safe and protected. You don't want Sulaiman and Amit to crush you and they won't perceive it. That's a place of a their place. That's a place where you're not the only one that's important anymore. You're in a new place where there's other people equally important. One of the beautiful things about Islam is about the element of opening, opening spaces and opening places for people. It's quite sad sometimes when you read accounts of people, you know, young kids you know, who suffer, uh, suffer bullying or who suffer from loneliness or who suffer from exclusion or they don't feel a sense of belonging. But what, is it, what should it would mean for us as Muslims when you're the Muslim and there's other people around you, how should you make other people feel in that place? My khutbah today, today was about the uh, arrival of Umar al-Khattab into, Beit, into Jerusalem, into Beit al-Maqdis. And when he yeah. arrived into Jerusalem, it was really a phenomenal moment because the patriarch, patriarch Sophronius, it told the people that I will only give the keys to the Khalif, to the Amir of the Muslims. And in that case, it was Umar al Khattab, not to Amr ibn As, who was the governor who actually captured Jerusalem. He wanted, to, he wanted Umar himself to take the keys. So Umar's entrance, therefore, is very profound, almost paradigmatic. It's very key. It's very key for many reasons because that landscape of Jerusalem was a landscape of prophets it was Suleiman and his father Dawood but there's an interesting line about about Suleiman uh, in the Quran when Allah speaks about the queen Bilqis right so an interesting thing happens between them you know, and he said there's a, a hoopoo there's a bird and it dispatches a letter and uh, and when Suleiman and when Bilqis receives a letter she asks her advisors and says what do you think I've got this dispatch from Suleiman right and it says in it, you know, it says, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. It says in the name of Allah, the most merciful, most gracious, uh, uh, Muslimin, don't exalt over me and then and come to me in submission. What do you think? And they say, Well, that's easy. We're, we're strong and powerful. Why do you have to stress and worry about Suleiman? We can easily deal with that problem. But then she says, Qalat, إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا 
He says, you see, the issue is that whenever kings enter into new places, they ruin them. And they make the noble ones the subjugated ones. Now then Allah says, This last part of the ayah, Ibn Abbas says, this is Allah speaking. This is Allah like affirming what Bilqis has in her mind. And Allah says, that, that is how they do things. That is how it's actually done. <laughs> That's the standard practice. Right, of doing things. So this so is an element of fair. Right? So when Suleiman therefore is is uh, you know hears he hears the sounds of there because Allah gave him that ability, he could hear what the ants are saying. And Allah says, min qawliha. He smiled. Now that's a disposition, that's you, that's your heart speaking. We're not made up only of like just the, the limbs and our movements. We have a conscience, we have a mind, we have a heart that's all working in tandem simultaneously at the same time you're feeling things so Suleiman when he hears the words of the ant uh, he smiled now that's now a new place he's entering which is a place of, of elsewhere because he makes a prayer to Allah and he says قَالَ رَبِّ أَوْزِعْنِي أَنْ أَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَكَ لَتَمْتَ عَلَيْهُ وَعَلَى وَالِدَيْ وَأَنْوَالَ الصَّالِحًا تَرَضَاهُ وَأَدْخِلْنِي بِرَحْمَتِكَ فِي إِبَادِكَ الصَّالِحِينَ he says, my Lord, Allah, inspire me to thank you for what you've blessed me with and blessed my parents with. right? And inspire me to do good actions that you're pleased with. And and, and to me by your mercy amongst your pious servants. So think about how Suleiman, therefore, is now transitioning through space. And what about you? Think about how you're also transitioning. You came from your homes and that's a place you're familiar with. Now you're entering into a new place, but that's not your it's not just your your space, it's other people in that place, right? There could be weaker people than you, there could be people who are needy. You know, if you think about university, it's like you have a... I've been in university for 10, 11 years, I'm still a research fellow, I'm still there, right? And I've, you see so many diverse, different people, and humanity is really a, a myriad of different life experiences. Every single one of you, it's just a... a uniquely uniquely different person right but what does islam teach us about how to engage with others with respect to differences is to open spaces of understanding of tolerance of empathy it's like the woman that came and said ya rasulullah and it says kana fi aqliha she had a mental illness we have a lot of people who have mental like uh, you could say they struggle you know, people even who have like loneliness or depression or anxiety or suffer with lack of self-esteem, all of these are examples of some imbalance that shouldn't be there, but it's there. And so the woman came and it says in the narration she had a mental illness. She had something in her mind, like uh, some weakness in her mind. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, or Messenger of Allah, Inna li ilayka hajj, I have a need I'd like you to fulfill for me. Now think about the prophetic response to that woman, what she said and what, how we should behave and speak to others that we might see around us. He said to that woman, Ya Um Fulan, O oh, the mother of so and so. Now even before we get to the discourse, think about his opening address to that woman by saying, O oh, the mother of so and so. Just think it about it just before you even continue, what does it mean? What is he saying to that woman? He's acknowledging that is a person who already has a sphere of great responsibility as a mother. She's already somebody who has achieved a lot because she has, she's a mother. She already has so many people who are dependent on her because she's a mother. Ya Um Fulan, O oh, the mother of so and so, you choose, Unzuri, you choose which road you would like me to traverse on with you so I could fulfill your need for you. It's a really profoundly beautiful hadith. Because if you think about what the Prophet is telling that woman, you know, we have like, uh, we have Mental Health Awareness Day coming up on the, I think, the 10th of October. And, and also the week from the 13th, I think, to the 19th, Mental Health Awareness Week. Here's a, a classical example, right? So you have a woman who is, who is struggling with this issue. The Prophet gave her a power of choice. Right? What does it mean if you have dealt with kids who have autism or Asperger's? One of the things that they struggle with is they think that you know other people should make choices for them. Do this or don't do that, do this. Until it becomes a point where they're unable to make their own choices. The Prophet is giving that woman a power of choice. You choose which road you'd like me to walk on with you so I could fulfill your need for you. Really profound. But the whole 
idea here is just about how we're learning to navigate through spaces of here, of there, and of elsewhere. And it's quite an interesting way for us to look to look at this. Now at the same time then, Sulaiman alayhi salam, by the way, when he when this whole incident happens, there is a bird that's missing. Missing company. It's the hoopoo, the hood hood. So when Sulaiman's made his prayer, he says, What's up with where is the bird? One of his key paywall. And he says, See it, what has it gone like absconded? Uh, ab, hey, well, what's happened with it? And he was angry. He said, If it, I'm going to punish it, teach it a lesson because it should be with us with the army. But when the hood hood then returns, we learn an amazing thing for us, all of us, in this space of a university and learning. Because when the hood hood arrives, hood hood says to Sulaiman these words, he's intrigued, a blessing from, but it could be that you, you're, it could be that you honor it, show gratitude. Every single day of your life at university, you new things right there come a time where you might think you know when you get older you might think okay i have this great degree and this masters all of this and this amazing knowledge and then you'll encounter somebody else who has a different degree than you and they're explaining how beautiful their degree is like when i, I speak to my students and others and they're doing things like my my whole life is spent studying history my ba masters phd is all history my postdoc is international relations and people I know study anthropology and they study like, you know, education. So it's different things. And it's really, I feel like, oh my God, why didn't I do that when I had the chance, you know, and what's happened, you know. And it's always a kind of, a, uh, you always want to learn more. You always want to have that ability. So whilst you're here, therefore, there's a great responsibility on you to always be grateful people. Like Suleiman, when he encountered the bird, and the bird knew something that he didn't know. And his first response was, this is a test from Allah. Am I grateful or am I ungrateful? You know, am I a grateful person? What does it mean to be grateful? And one of the Israeli artists says that Allah, Dawood alayhi salam says to Allah, Ya Rabbi, my Lord, akhbirni ma adna ni'maka alayhi. Tell me what is the least of your favors to me? And Allah says to Dawood, you know, tanafas, breathe. And Dawood, fatanafas, I breathed. And Allah says, this is the least of my favors to you. The fact that you're still breathing and you still have life. We buried, the, we had janazah today for a boy who was 15 years old. Two weeks before, we had another janazah for a boy who was also 15 years old. There's two 15-year-old children who are in our now town in Afsal. The janazah, one janazah was today, the other one was last week or the week before. The fact that you're still breathing means you're still alive. And that you're still alive, that means you have this whole frame of opportunities in front of you. And when you approach mm -hmm. them, you approach them with a degree of humility and understanding. Right? There's different ways that you, you look at yourself in this frame. Let's say you're learning a lot now, you've passed your exams, your second year, third year, you're really acing everything. Right? You know, the way that you, your mind and heart is working at this moment will have a very big effect on what you would become tomorrow and later on in life. Very, very big effect. Allah gives us examples of both types of people, those who were arrogant, arrogant because of their knowledge, you know. Like, uh, I mean, Allah in the Quran does say, you know, Kalla inna insana liyaftada that man transgresses limits when he sees himself as independent, self sufficient. You guys are like living yourself here, you have no parents here with you, you have your own money perhaps, you're buying your own food, own clothes, and it's all kind of independent and it all feels good to be free, you know, in that sense, that's okay. But, but you don't transgress the limits just because you are now becoming kind of have this pseudo-independence. The example, the negative one Allah gives in the Quran about the abuse of knowledge is the example of Qarun, one example. Because Allah says that Qarun, he had so much money, he would have taken a band of strong men to carry the keys of his treasures. So when the people, they see him, they said to him, you know what, la tafrah, don't exalt. Because Allah doesn't love those who exalt and become so proud as if this is like, you know, my, my own mm -hmm. making. They said to him, وَبْتَغِي فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهِ دَارَ الْآخِرِ With what Allah has given you of, of this knowledge, of this power, wealth, seek heaven. Seek the next life. Make that as an investment for you for the next life. But so when he hears them out, what does he say to them? قَالْ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي Whatever I have is my own knowledge. 
I am where I am today because of what I have learned. Right? How many people think like that? You know, as if you yourself have learned everything and this is why you're... you're, you're no. You never see it like that. You see it as a, a gift from Allah. Your knowledge is a gift from Allah. And it isn't you. The ulama, they say, beware of three words. Ana, wali, wa indi. I, for me, myself, with me. Because it was shaitan that said to Allah, Ana khayrun minhu, I am better than him, meaning Adam. It was Fir'aun who said, Alaysa li mulk Misr, isn't the kingdom of Egypt for me? It was Qarun in this case who said, uh, whatever I have is from my own knowledge, you know. So we never attribute that to ourselves. It's a gift from Allah. Always see that as you're traversing through these days at university, every footstep is just a gift from Allah. Every new learning is a gift from Allah. And the more you thank Allah, the more Allah will make you so super intelligent. Like Allah in the Quran says, in shakartum la'azidannakum. If you thank Allah, Allah would increase you. Wallah, honestly, every single time you open a new page of your book, if you say, Alhamdulillah, thank you Allah, or you've learned something, you say, SubhanAllah, you know, you thank Allah for that, it's fine. You know, your, your, your learning is enhanced. Your attitude to learning is improved. Your whole experience of being in a classroom is now is different, right? Because you're connecting your spaces to the most profound space, which is the elsewhere space between you and Allah. The moment you sit down and you raise your hands to Allah, that's your elsewhere space. You've, you've transitioned now from the place of the, uh, the power, your individualism, to the ants, other spaces. Now it's the elsewhere. Now it's Suleiman and Allah. My Lord, inspire me. That's you on the prayer mat. That's your supplications to Allah. And that's like what Ibn Qayyim was saying about, he would say, how thick is your coat? How thick is your coat? Because if your coat isn't thick, then you couldn't survive the winter months. And in this analogy, what he was saying was that if you have no spiritual armament, that means you're exposed to all of the outside negative elements. That means you're, you're at risk. You're at risk. But if you focus on your elsewhere space between you and Allah, meaning you're never negligent of your prayers, you're always going to ask Allah for assistance, you're always needy, dependent on Allah, the knowledge has not made you arrogant, proud, it's all the fact that you're just a slave, a servant of Allah, who's in need of assistance. Like the prayer, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayhi, this is the dua of uh, Musa alayhi salam. You know, it's Musa alayhi salam's dua, when he comes and he's escaped, and he comes to Madian, and he sees those two women, and he helps them water their sheep, then Allah says, then he turns towards the shade and says, Rabbi, my Lord, inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. Whatever good you send me, I'm just desperately in need of it. Not like I've just gained everything and I'm just so cool because I have everything. No. Whatever small, big blessing you give me, I'm desperately in need of it. You're a humble servant of Allah. Mm -hmm. That's what a Muslim is. Right? So never therefore allow your knowledge to become a kind of a source of delusion for you, let it become a blessing for you. Right? And that's really how we our mindset should be about knowing and about learning. And these are key things for us to always bear in mind. Now, whatever you learn, of course, should have the correct intention. The Prophet says that in the niyat, actions are by intentions. And every man will have what he intended. So you will have what you intended. If you're seeking knowledge for whatever reasons you are seeking, seeking, it, seeking it, then that's what you will have. But if you're seeking the knowledge, whether it's science or astronomy or anything you're doing, could have a public benefit, can be beneficial. If your intention is, I'm going to learn whatever I'm learning to be of benefit to myself, to humanity, to other people, that's that's a reward. That's an act of worship. That's a good deed. Because you're making your intention solely for Allah's pleasure. And it could be therefore that as you're navigating through the days and months and weeks and flapping you know, the pages of your exams, that's reward for you. You could get reward for that. That could be an act of worship for you because it's something done for Allah's sake. 
And when the Prophet says, Man kharja fi talib al ilm, whoever comes out in search of knowledge, he's in the way of Allah. I mean, that could be something beneficial knowledge, right? The Prophet, in fact, would pray every morning after Fajr, Allahumma inni asaluka ilman nafi'an, or Allah grant me beneficial knowledge. He would also say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilman la yanfa. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from knowledge that has no benefit, meaning lack of benefit knowledge. Therefore, your prayer always should be, make my knowledge a benefit. The man came, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyun nas, habbu ila dal. Which people are the most beloved people to Allah? Right? Who's the most beloved to Allah? And the Prophet in this hadith, he said, habban nasi ila Allah and fa'uhum lin nas. The most beloved people to Allah, those who bring the most benefit to people. Right? So you think in your mind, I'm mean, learning all this stuff and my parents are paying so much money for me. This is another thing about the, 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 the greatness of your parents. Notice what Suleiman says in his prayer. Maybe you picked up on it yourself. What does he say? My Lord, inspire me to thank you for what you've blessed me with and blessed my parents with. Who was his father? Dawood right. So you don't forget who's championed you, rooted for you all these years until you finally get here. Who's prayed at night desperately, oh Allah, send my son to you. you must, you know, who's done that? Your mom and your dad. I always say that success is established, predicated on a few things. You know, One is going to be Allah's like tawfiq from Allah. Second is like your own effort. Allah in the Quran says, wa لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى وَأَنَّ السَّعِيُ صَفِرَى Man will have what he made effort for. And then you'll see the fruits of his labor and the is like your mom and your father's dua for you. Don't forget that. Right, so even though you might be living here on campus, away from parents, don't let a day pass where you haven't acknowledged that, or, or spoken with your parents, or thanked your parents. You know, these are things that are so instrumental for you. Because what's going to happen is that every time you pass your exam, it's going to seem as if your mom has passed her exam, or your father passed his exam, isn't it? Maybe they didn't have the same opportunities as, as you now have. But whenever you, you, you don't do well in your exam or you fail your exam, it's going to seem as if your mom and dad has failed their exams, isn't it? That's how we're all connected. If I make that an extra incentive for you to try your best to do well, to make your mom smile, or make your dad smile, therefore that's an extra good deed for you, right? So always therefore remember these as you navigate through your university life. We were speaking about the importance of... Uh, of beneficial knowledge and doing things for the public benefit. It's very, very key, very key thing in Islam to think like that, you know, for you as a Muslim. Uh, once, uh, uh, once Umar al-Khattab, he, in his khilaf, he, met, he saw an old man. And the old man, he, his, his field was not sowed. He hadn't sowed his seeds in his land, in his patch of land. And Umar approached the old man and says to him, Ma What is preventing you from sowing your seeds in your, in your land? And the old man says, you know, Ana shaykhun kabir amud ghadan. I'm an old man, I'm going to die tomorrow. So what is the need for me to sow my seeds if I'm going to die tomorrow? And Umar says, I'm compelling you. You're going to sow your seeds. And then the old man's son says, I saw Umar the next day on the floor with my old father and they both you know, tilling the ground. The whole point was that, you know, you're going to think of yourself as a public servant. You're going to see yourself as being at the service of humanity. You're going to see yourself as being, you know, you're, you're seeking, therefore, and what you're doing is not just there to benefit you, but to benefit others. One of the statements of uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, who was the chief rabbi who became the Muslim, Allah be pleased with him, Sahabi, he says, in dajjal qad kharaj, if you hear the news that the Dajjal Antichrist has emerged, and you're in the valley and you're sowing your seeds, he says, don't delay. Why? Because فَإِنَّ لِلنَّاسِ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ عَيْشٍ Because after he comes and goes, people will live. And if people will live, then they'll still need the trees for the fruits and the shade. And meaning, if you stop doing what, what's supposed to bring public benefit to others, then it's going to be at the detriment of yourself and other people. The Prophet said, Ihras ala mayanfaak wasta'in billah wa la ta'jaz. He says, Be eager to do what will benefit you, what will benefit, and seek assistance from Allah, and don't feel like encumbered, don't feel as if you're so fatigued 
without motivation always have that degree of motivation, right? You know, one of the beautiful things about when I think about university is I think about the paradigm of growth. What does it mean to grow? You know, like if you look at yourself from when you have year one to year three or four, you'll see, you'll feel that sense of, of growth in you. But what does it mean to grow? You know, if you think about everything that Allah created has growth. Even the twig, even the insect, the butterfly, everything, the ant has, everything has some measure of growth. It might grow for a day, part of a day, half a day, year, full lifetime. And between the point of growth and the end point, the point of determination, there is a middle phase. What is that middle phase? Between, you know, for everything that is growing, the middle phase is obstacles. Everything, like if, it, if, you, if you imagine the, the, the leaf, the plant will face the heavy storm, will face the heavy rain. If you imagine like the, the antelope will face the lion, you know, you have prey and you have predators. If you think about humans, we also have impediments, we have obstacles, we suffer from illnesses and disease and, and all of these things. All of these are impeding upon our, our physical growing. But that can't be the main growth Allah intends for you as a student, as a Muslim. Because what about those who, who, are, who can't grow? They have like German syndrome where they can't grow. What about this unfair then? The most beautiful idea of growth we should have in our minds and our hearts is like the example of Maryam, السلام, Mary, Maryam in the Quran. So Maryam's example is very unique. It's very unique what Allah is telling us about Maryam and also her mother, Hanna what they call Saint Anne, you know, Hannah. Because Allah in the Quran is saying that the mother had this amazing aspiration. Allah says, إِذْ قَلَتْ إِمْرَأَةُ إِمْرَانْ رَبِّي إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِ مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَلَ مِنِّي إِنَّ كَنْ تَسْمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ She says, uh, my Lord, whatever is moving in my womb, mm -hmm. I dedicate for your service. Right? The whatever I'm going to give birth to, I want that to be him or him or her to be in your service. And you're all hearing and you're all knowing. And then she gives birth. فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا She says, Allah, I've given birth to a girl, Maryam in this case. وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرْ كَالْأُنْثَى And the girl isn't like the boy. Right? In that time in Jerusalem, you know, you would have expectations. If it was a boy that was born, the boy could be a scribe, could be a poet, could be an orator, could be a scholar, all these functions. But what role could a girl have in society? Not that many, not as many as the boys. But she never allowed that to become her impediment. She never said to herself, well, that, that's kind of the plan down the drain because I was a good plan to begin with and it's all finished. No. If the point number one is aspiration, the second point is going to be kind of perseverance. She persevered in that, you know. I gave birth to a girl, I've named her Maryam, and you know, I seek refuge with you for her and her progeny. Then she grows up. Anything that grows needs cultivation, right? If you're in a space like this, there's going, to be, there's going to be some things that could be hazardous for you, like in your iman, in your faith. There could be things that are forbidden for you. could be things that are kind of detracting you. There could be things that are, are calling you for wasting time. You should be revising. All of these things could be impediments for you. Maryam is amazing because Allah says that, وَأَنْبَتَهَا uh, نَبَاتًا hasana. And Allah uses the word about growth. And Allah says that Allah accepted the oath that her mother made and Allah allowed her to grow a beautiful growth. Does not mean that Maryam was only growing in her like physical being, physical strength. Doesn't mean she's only growing in age. It means Maryam is growing in her intellectual maturity, growing in her spirit, growing in her closeness to Allah, growing in her mannerism, her character. All of these things are growing in Maryam. That's what excellent growth means. So when you're, if, you're, if you're passing the years and you see yourself, well, how old was I when I started university? Okay, how old am I now? That means I've been in university. Too. How, how, how have I grown? You have to try and measure, self-evaluate what's been your points of growth and what's affected your growing. What's been the obstacle that's prevented your growing. Right? Just like the plant. Right? So Maryam is growing, but Allah then says, وَكَفَّلَهَا زَكَرِيَّ And Allah points Zakaria over her, who was her relative, her uncle. And so Zakaria, uh, therefore, whenever you have growth, you have to have cultivation. You have to have somebody 
Who's going to assist that growth, enable that growth? You can't uh, see a plant growing in the darkness. A plant would grow if you place it near the sun, if you look after it, water it. All of these things enable and facilitate growth. So every one of you, therefore, is actually growing. And I need to finish. Let's finish my point about the growth. You're all, we're all growing. But we're growing at different, different ways. It doesn't mean, therefore, those who are... You know, when I was in school, the secondary school, I remember there was a girl in my class. She came, she came straight from Iran or Iraq. My daughter calls Iran, Iran. <laughs> Iran. So she's got a friend. She said, Papa, do you know where Iran is? Uh, she's obviously trying to say Iran. You know. I said, I don't know where Iran is. I just play along with her. I yeah, Iran. I wish I could go to Iran. <laughs> and so she said, uh, and the girl was from Iran, but she, uh, she couldn't speak English. And there was another girl from my class from Iraq, and they could both speak Arabic, and, and she used to help her in the class and everything. But she had such phenomenal, subhanAllah, learning ability that she would just ace all the exams and, and come first in a class, and even in art, math, science, religion, everything. You know? And I think about that as kind of an accelerated sense of growing. Both her parents were doctors, maybe that maybe helped her, Allah knows best, or her hard work. But what if we can't, what if you're not, uh, or what if we, we can't get there? I mean, I, I really struggled when I was in school with sciences. You know, I don't know if this university has sciences, you know. I, yeah. I, I struggled with sciences. I, I tried my best. I studied the most. Probably I revised the hardest, I think, but I just couldn't get there. I was good in the humanities, but not very good in the sciences, you know. There's a tree called, a, who's heard of the Chinese bamboo tree? You've heard of it? Yeah. Now look at the Chinese bamboo tree. We, we can all imagine ourselves sometimes the Chinese bamboo tree. Chinese bamboo tree, you have to sow your seeds. When a farmer sows the seeds of the Chinese bamboo tree, uh, he, will, he will water the ground, you know, the, 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 the area where he sowed his seeds. And he'll wait a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and there's no growth. Nothing has sprouted. He'll wait a month, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months, and nothing has grown. He'll wait one year, and, and the ground is as it is. Nothing has grown for the Chinese bamboo tree. Other trees have all grown, plants have grown, flowers have budded, everything's beautiful, color, this patch of land, nothing, no growth. And then he'll come to the second year, and he'll start doing the same thing. He'll water, every day he'll water, every day he'll water. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, second, nothing has grown. The second year will pass, and it is as it was. And then the third year will come, and he will do the same thing. He will plant, he will water, 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 and then it's just the same thing, and it is as it is. Come the fourth year, fifth year, on the fifth year, Chinese bamboo tree, you should research it, he'll start seeing growth from the ground. The tree will begin to grow. And when it grows, in six weeks, this tree will grow 113 meters tall. It doesn't mean the tree wasn't growing. It was growing under the earth. It needed strong roots to sustain and maintain its accelerated growth from in the fifth year. So don't think sometimes, you know, I'm trying so hard but nothing's happening, nothing's working, why isn't that? Oh, maybe you're actually, you are growing. But your roots are growing. And that means your sense of maturity is building. That means you have the foundation that's strengthened. And then when you grow, you'll have this amazing sprout, accelerated growth, right? And then you shock yourself, how did that happen all of a sudden? And you say, SubhanAllah. And you say, Wa tawfiq illa billah. Right? So all of us are growing and transitioning, but we grow at different times, different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And we ask Allah, we're going to break now, inshallah, for, for salah. And then inshallah, we'll continue for a short time, inshallah, after salah.
All right, we continue. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. There's there's nothing like uh, like the salah, like the prayer, because the prayer is like this really amazing reminder, re-reminder about your purpose. You know, your purpose is to acknowledge He that created you, sustains you, gives you air to breathe, gives you life gives you mind, consciousness, feelings, memory and Allah says just five times a day just acknowledge Him you know, and it's something, Allah in the Quran in fact says وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي establish salah for my remembrance you know, we remember every different icon, celebrity you know, pseudo-celebrity you know, uh, in the world and the one that's the Lord of them all, sustains them, inspires them, is Allah. You know, Allah is saying, just stand in for my remembrance, subhanAllah. And there's an amazing feeling of, uh, of, uh, of peace and tranquility that we, of course, all value you know, with respect to the prayer, subhanAllah. Okay, so we're speaking about, therefore, different dimensions of you know, how we understand our life as students and being at university. Uh, what does it mean to be a Muslim, you know, as, as one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the context of, of a university landscape, in the context of a student, as a student, as someone who's, who's learning things, you know. 
and we were before we broke up we were speaking about the idea of of growth and how how we grow as human beings how we grow as muslims uh, at some point we have you know allah even gives us like some times like ramadan is a month of accelerated growth some days you have arafah places makkah medina jerusalem all of these are are, are like uh, mediums allah gives us to accelerate our sense of growing but in in university you'd notice that growth because you're going by the year and you're going to see yourself you know uh, growing in different ways but the most meaningful growth is like I mentioned the growth that's inside of you your spiritual growth your closeness to Allah is, a, is a, an amazing sense of growth your intellectual maturity your emotional intelligence amazing modes of, of growing and growth and that's really how we should evaluate ourselves you know don't only see yourself uh, I've aged obviously so I'm a one year older I've grown physically but have we grown in our hearts, have we grown in our character? Have we grown in our sense of being? That's really the main main time main time of growth. Other thing I would really remind you of, uh, since you're students in this university, uh, is to make use of time and to value time. You know, everything like all success and failure is bound by time. Those who succeed succeed within time. Those who fail fail within time. And Allah in the Quran is very very. Uh, Allah is very like Allah emphasizes a lot about the importance of time. You probably all know the Surah Al Asr in the Quran. Wal Asr, Inna Insana Lafi Khusr. Allah is saying, by the token of time, uh, all men are in loss. Everybody's in loss by the token of time. Illalladina Amnu, except those who believe and work righteous actions and then come together in truth and come together in patience. So either, if you think about time and loss, either we misuse time, abuse time, we don't value time, we, we kind of uh, don't respect time, or we value time. You know, we make use of time, we honor time. So everything, therefore, since, the day, since your morning begins, that's time for you. How are you going to use your time? Right? Easy to go through the motions and kind of just... You know, waste your life by not really respecting the element of time. But when you're really conscious of time, it makes a very big difference to your day and night. What it what does it mean for you, as a human being, as a Muslim? What does it mean that you're you're kind of transitioning through time? One of the Sahaba would say, "Ya bin Adam, or son of Adam, in the layla when the hari yamalan fiq, the nights and the days are working hard on you. Fa'mal fihima. So why don't you work hard in those nights and days?" Right? Nice and days are working hard to distract you, to occupy you somewhere else that's not always to your advantage and benefit. Why don't you work hard in those nights and days to do something um, remarkable in yourself? They would say, Ibn Adam or son of Adam, innama anta ayyam, all you are is a collection of days. Fa'idha dhahaba yawm and one day leaves you, dhahaba ba'duk, a part of you has also left you. Right? So we're losing ourselves through the passing of time. But we can also gain so much of ourselves and new elements of ourselves through honoring time and through maximizing our use of time. So therefore, have some kind of a, a plan for yourselves. You know, I remember when I was at university in the beginning for my undergraduate degree, I used to walk to university to the I used to walk to the bus stop and it was around a thirty five minute walk. Then waiting for the bus could take like fifteen minutes or so and then Getting to university was like a good half an hour and then the same pattern on the way back and I, and I would tell myself What what am I doing in 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 that in getting to university the half an hour the another half an hour on the bus and that's like Could be a two hours there and back, you know But you can do a lot within that time. It's a lot you can learn. It's a lot you can write It's a lot you can do. It's a lot you can Verbalize it's so many things you could do within that time. There's book Quran you could memorize, there's hadith you could memorize, there's lines of poetry you could memorize, there's so many things you could do within that time. But if you're conscious of it like that, that means you're you're conscious, am I wasting my time? And Allah in the Quran of course is stressing this again and again. Allah for example says, Oh you who believe, spend out what we provided you, meaning be charitable. Before a day comes. Now, the before a day comes, meaning you've now lost time. Don't get to the point where you, if you were not charitable in life and your death comes upon you, then you would wish, Oh Allah, send me back to the earth and I would become charitable and become pious. Right? But the, the point is the time is now over. 
So whilst you have the time, therefore, and you have the blessings, make use of them. And everything in yourselves is a blessing. The Prophet said, Take care of five before five. Take care of your youth before you grow old. I mean, how many zeal, enthusiasm, activism, how much energy you have in you when you're young, right? I'm not saying that the elderly don't have it. Sometimes they have it more, actually, more than us. But when you're young, you have a lot of that sense of, you know, you know, genius, mind, of new ideas. And look at the amazing work of Greta Thunberg, what she's doing for climate change. She's only young, 15, 16 years old, you know. There's many examples like that in the world, you know, of people who are, are just young but they have a sense of passion and drive, right? You shouldn't, you should always have that in you. You know, think about very good, noble causes you can get involved with, you know, and just kind of be kind of championing them. The Prophet says, take care of take care of your health before you become sick. You don't always remain healthy. You're not always able, you're not always, you know, uh, the way you are when you're healthy. So before you get to a point where you're not as healthy as you once were, make use of your health, the Prophet is saying. When you're healthy, do more. Pray more, you know, mm-hmm. fast more, recite more, do more goodness in your life when you're healthy. He said, Iqtanim, take care of your faragh qabla shughli, take care of your free time before you become busy. What happens when life takes over and you get married and you have kids and then you kind of think, oh, what happens now? <laughs> Just kidding, it's beautiful in its own way. But you, you'll value the time where you didn't have that sense of responsibility, you know, because if your time is free. You can do so much things when you're just free. You don't have, don't have no bills to pay, the house to rent. You, 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 don't have a, you don't have to worry about those things as yet. You know, but when they come, it's all we'll be fine, it's all good. But, but you're, when you're free, it's very different to being busy. He said, Iqtanim, take care of your, uh, what have I missed? What's the fourth one? So, health before you become sick, youth before you grow old, time, be- ah, take care of your wealth before you become poor. Those people who have lost all their money, they were once wealthy, they became poor. So when you're wealthy, invest that money. Not mm-hmm. just invest in this life, but make an investment for the next life. The, what they were telling Qarun, the people around them, they were saying, why don't you invest some of your money? Like have an investment for the next life, you know, feed people, honor people, clothe people, build an orphanage, you know, build a mosque, do something good that people will benefit from long after you've died. That's your investment for the next life. Be charitable. I know the brother was saying you have an amazing charity week in this university, which is a beautiful thing. Have a lot of them, do a lot of work like that, you know, to really alleviate the suffering of all kinds of people. And that's to your credit, that's like your investment for the next life, right? That, that will stay with you long after you've died. And then he says, take care of your life before you die. See, so your life as a whole, take care of it. Meaning, don't abuse it, don't abuse yourself with substances, don't abuse yourself with intoxicants, don't abuse yourself. Be sane, free mind, free thinking, energetic, agile, think about you know, important things in life. That's how a Muslim should be. Right? So when you're at university, you kind of have an extra advantage because you're around, surrounded by other people who have that same sense of incentive and drive and ambition. And it rubs off on you. So therefore, take use, make use of time. And that would also facilitate and enhance your sense of growing. Now the third thing I have here, which is really should be the first of all things, which is taqwa. What is the meaning of taqwa? Good consciousness. Good, good. Any others? Sorry? Protection. Protection, good, good. Any others? Piety. Piety. Yeah, I mean all of them really encapsulated in that one word of taqwa. To have a sense of consciousness of Allah your responsibilities, reverence, fear, hope, trust of Allah, all in one. Taqwa. The moment you lose sight of this, you lose sight of yourself. And Allah in the Quran is saying, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ صُلَّى فَأَنْسَمْنَ فَسَمْ Don't be like those who forgot Allah, and then they were made to forget themselves. Right? What does it mean to forget yourself? 
Like you're forget you're forgetting your role, responsibility, your your kind of uh, your op opportunities. You're forgetting your everything about you because you forgot Allah. And what keeps you focused on that is to always remind yourself about taqwa, right? You know, when the Prophet was, was sending uh, his companion Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen to call the Christians to Islam, he gave him this advice, he said to him, he said, ma kunt. He said, fear Allah wherever you are. Just because you're in a university setting and your parents aren't here, doesn't give us the permission to now flout you know, the laws of Allah. Right? And you think, well, I'm here, I can do whatever I want. No one's watching, but Allah is watching you. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. Allah is a witness over all things. Right? So taqwa means to remind yourself, I am being watched by Allah. I'm always being accounted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So that's something that has to be in our mind all the time. To always be mindful, I'm servant of Allah and Allah is observing everything I'm doing. Right? Be conscious of the words you speak and how you speak them. Be conscious of your actions and how you perform them. You know, be conscious with respect to yourself and other people, meaning have an excellent character. This was one hadith the Prophet said, you know, for Allah wherever you are, and follow up the bad deed with the good one and wipe it away. That means never lose hope. If you make mistakes, as we all make mistakes, doesn't mean you lose hope. We always have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a sad case of this young boy. I really felt sad for, for him and his parents. You might have heard on the news story who committed suicide. He failed his, uh, I think, mechanical engineering degree. And then he told his parents he had passed, but he had failed, in fact, his degree. And, then, and they were expecting the graduation day for him to graduate. I think on that day, he, he hanged himself. You know, and he lost. I mean, that's like a sense of losing hope. I felt very sad, you know, for his parents and for him as well. Uh, but however you are, wherever you are in life, never ever get to the point where you lose hope, not in yourself, nor in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you always remember the idea about growing, at certain points you have accelerated growth, at other points you don't grow like it's not observable, but perhaps you are growing like the Chinese bamboo tree, but your roots are growing strong. Remember also the struggle of Hajra, the wife of Ibrahim salam, in the Sa'i. Because the sa'i is like, sa'i means effort, it means labor, you're working hard. But the sa'i symbolically is like framed with part walking and then part running and then part climbing. And life is like that. At certain points in life you're walking and everything is fine, then you have to speed up and you're running. Other times it's even worse, you have to exert your effort and you have to climb a little bit. And I always see it as kind of symbolic of life itself, that sense of effort and labor. As long as you're moving, you're still moving. Like the famous words of uh, Nelson Mandela told my son, what's the words of Nelson Mandela, Daifa? We learned the other day. The greatest glory of living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time you fall. Nelson Mandela. The greatest glory of living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time you fall. Again, the greatest glory of living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time you fall. Nelson Mandela. You know, so just means just mean, if you have a bump, you know, and you have and you're slipping and you're kind of thinking, well, what's happening? Doesn't mean everything's failed. And even if you fall, you get up, and that's the beauty of living. Right, you you re-exert yourself, you re-energize yourself, and you get back up, and that, and you come back with a with a better version of yourself the second time. That's something. It's so in a right from the because of the fall, the great fall. Allah never describes it by eating from the tree. Fall. Allah describes it as a slip. Allah says that Adam and his wife slipped. Zal is not the same as a fall. It's like when you guys leave your homes, you should recite. Uh, either I, uh, that I slip, cause others to slip, trip. Slipping is different as, as you're falling. We all stumble and slip in lives, but hope, 
always waiting, right? The, the, the poet said that, he said, مَا مَضَى فَاتَ وَالْمُؤَمَّ الْغَيْبِ he said, whatever has passed, has passed. Whatever is going to come is in the unseen, but you have the hour with you today to make that difference. Right? So your mind, if you're, if you're self-evaluating and you're always kind of self-accounting, you can get there. But you have to think things through. And the biggest strength you will have is taqwa. The biggest strength you will have is your consciousness of Allah. The biggest strength you will have is your reliance on Allah. Right? Allah never allows us to lose hope in Him, in His mercy. And these things are much less than that. Right? So it's not like a heaven and hell issue here. It's about your father. But still you need to make sure you, you do well to pass. But never lose hope. Always be you know, super confident in these things. Uh, now the other thing, the last thing the Prophet says to Mu'adh ibn Jabal. This is Mu'adh, he's now leaving. It's a very dramatic hadith. He's kind of going you know, on his camel. And the Prophet is walking beside him. And the Prophet is telling him, like advice, he's saying, Ya Mu'ad, Mu'ad, yastira wa la tu'astira wa bashira wa la tunafira. Make things easy for those people. Don't make things hard for them. Give them good news. Don't make them run away from you. Run away from Islam. Don't make that happen. And then Mu'ad says, Wa akhir ma awsani bihi. The last advice the Prophet gave me when I put my foot on the saddle was, وَأَحْسِنْ خُلُقَكِ يَا مُعَادِ بِنْ جَبَلْ And make your character beautiful, O Mu'adi bin Jabal. Right? You know, your character is you. You are uh, projecting yourself to the world, students, teachers, everyone, based upon your character. You know, your behavior, your speech, your actions, all of this is a representation of who you are. And the person, he says that, you know, he said, indeed, in the, in the body, there is one lump of flesh. If it's sound and good, all of the body is good. But if it's corrupt, everything is corrupt. And that, indeed, that's the heart. The heart. And in Allah, لا ينظر إلى أجسامكم ولا إلى صوركم Allah does not look at your shapes and your forms, but looks at your hearts. Right? So your, your, your humanness is within your heart. Everything else is kind of... Is, is very important but it's not as important because it's still superficial in that sense because you're going to wither away and you're going to look different sometimes you know isn't it but what stays within you is your sense of being your heart your character the prophet said that ma min shay'in there is nothing athqalu fi mizal mu'min there's nothing that is heavier on the scale of the believer on the day of judgment than his character so your character, Ibn Qayyim would say, الدين كله خلق فمن زاد عليك في الخلق زاد عليك في الدين The whole religion, he said, is good character. Whoever, therefore, surpasses you in character has surpassed you in the religion. Because there's too many components of a good character that Allah loves. So I would really emphasize this for as my last point. Uh, have the best character. Be the most polite. Be the kindest people. You know, you don't know uh, where people are in life. You don't know what kind of a day people are having. You don't know what stresses people might have. You don't know anything. But our words can make such a difference. Do you guys remember studying uh, back in your heydays of school, secondary school? Remember studying An Inspector Calls by J.B. Priestley? Who studied that? One. Two, three, four, five. Anybody else? None of the men studied in spectacles? What did you guys study then? Okay, I guess. Uh. So an inspector calls by Priestley is the idea about this girl called Eva Smith that kills herself. It's a play. And so Priestley himself was a socialist. He projects like a socialist viewpoint through an inspector who comes as this kind of a voice of moral conscience. Then other characters like Sheila and Eric, who are also like uh, morally conscious, have consciousness. But the other families are all capitalists, the Berling family. And they're very much about greed and wealth and capital and business finance. And this young girl, Eva Smith, dies because each member of the family abused her. But some of them are it's because of the words they spoke, actions they performed. And remember that you're, and at the end he gives a speech to the inspector and he says that we are all one body, we're all one family. 
And the whole point he was trying to disseminate was that your actions you do today would affect what happened to Eva Smith tomorrow. And maybe she killed herself because of all of these things that you would have, you would have done. The whole point is that when you're interacting with people, you have a choice to use good words or bad words. Showing good manners or bad manners. But if you use good words and good manners, that's going to uplift those people, other people in their lives. So therefore, always be mindful of that. If you use good words, greet people with a smile, you know, show happiness, kind words, it will reflect back on you at the same time. Uh, and this is really uh, what an Islamic character means. And so in, in summary, therefore, before I, I finish now, we went through certain different points. We spoke in the beginning about spaces and navigating through spaces and transitioning through places. We spoke about the example of Suleiman and how we transitioned from a place of power and familiarity and kind of recognizability of human gene and birds to a place of, of newness of the ants, right? And they're small and they're, they're in need and they also have homes and therefore the whole point is emphasized in the Quran. And then the most important place was a place of, what was it? Who was listening? I see, you were listening. The place of uh, elsewhere. So from a here to a there to an elsewhere. And the elsewhere place is the place between you and Allah, like Suleiman's prayer to Allah. So everything you witness and observe should reflect back to your heart. You're making sense of it in your mind and your heart. Right? How is this what I'm seeing going to bring me close to Allah? You know, how is it going to transform me in different ways? You know, um, it just reminded me of something. I, I, was in, I was in Jerusalem just two weeks ago, went to pray in Al-Aqsa. And we went to... Uh, we went to a place where they believe that Musa al-Islam is buried, you know, because he and his people never got to the Holy Land in the Quran, Allah is telling us. And there was such a climactic moment in our group experience because uh, we got to the place where they said the Miqat, like the, the resting place is, and Allah truly knows best, but we got there. And uh, it was really beautiful. It's like in the desert. Like the Prophet in Hadith, he says it's like a, a, throw, a stone throw away out of Jerusalem. And that's where he's buried. And so and when we got there, uh, there was the place I think was locked. And one of the group leaders, he said, uh, he said these amazing words. And he's like, I, he said, uh, so he, he, he came and he kind of looked through the window and he said to the group, he said, well, he says, brothers and sisters, it looks as if this is as far as we're going to get today. And I kind of had this sudden shiver, you know, and I thought, my God, I thought, my God, your words are so, are so inspired because that's exactly why we're here, because that's as far as Musa could get. That's as far as, because you couldn't get to the Holy Land, you know, that's why we're here, because he's here, you know. And it's just, it was this amazing sense of recollection, trying to piece things together and that's how you navigate through life you piece things together and at different points you will have inspiration and amazing things will inspire you but don't let go of them you know you should either make notes of them record them do something because with that yourself and your character personality will really grow in life in really beautiful ways uh, and then we spoke about uh, you know knowledge knowledge and knowledge as a gift from Allah not as a measurement of your own self ability not like being like Qarun, who says it's all coming from me, right? Uh, then he goes out and he shows off. No, be humble, be humble, right? If, if you have amazing results, it's beautiful, but don't gloat to the point where you're, you're generating a culture of envy around you. Better to be humble and say, this is like we say, we say, وَمَا تُوفِيقُ إِلَّا بِلَا There's no success except with Allah. We say, لا قوة, no power except with Allah. We say, Masha Allah. We say, this is from Allah. Everything is attributable to Allah. Allah has given you the mind, isn't it? To work and to be able to do that. Allah gave you the ability in your limbs and your hands to write. Allah did it for you. When you do that, it's showing uh, you know, gratitude and acknowledgement. So that's important. Uh, and then we spoke about purpose, knowledge and purpose. So your students, the, what do you intend to do with your knowledge? Some people they learn, but they do terrible things with what they know, right? You know they can they can learn things, but they can learn how to harm people. They can learn how to do crazy evil things. You know, 
but that's still a learning process. They've learned something, you know. So when you guys are learning, have the greatest intention behind your learning. I want to be at the surface of humanity. This is what the Prophet says when he says that the most beloved Allah, anfa'uhum lin nas, and he used the word nas meaning all people. People, mankind, civilization, humanity, whatever you want to say. But the most beneficial to people. So make your learning therefore serve that purpose, serve that end. And then we spoke about growth and the whole analogy I gave of you know what Allah tells of Maryam in the Quran that she's growing like a plant, it's growing with a beautiful growth. It has to have found on number one an inspiration of a mother, like your mothers had inspira- had kind of an aspiration, sorry, for you guys. It must have been like your mother, father dreamed in their life, I wish for my son to be at university, I wish for my son to memorize Quran, I wish for my son X, Y, and Z, you know, these are all aspirations. Number two, even if things don't go according to your exact plan, never feel demotivated. Like Maryam's mother never felt, well, it's not a boy, it's a girl, what do I do? No, it's a girl, so it's a girl, she'll do whatever she can do in that capacity, right? So she never gave up. Perseverance. Number three, now you want to grow, but you can't grow without cultivation. You have to cultivate, to keep... If the people, you know, planting the Chinese bamboo tree stopped watering because they saw there's no growth, nothing's growing, it stopped growing underneath, isn't it? Then you wouldn't have any growth. The 130 meters tall after, after six weeks in the fifth year. So cultivate growth. B, then notice that Maryam placed, that Maryam's uh, mother, Hannah, placed Maryam mm-hmm. in Al-Aqsa, in Jerusalem, right? A, a, around pious people. Her mihrab is there, you know, her sanctuary is there. So she's being placed in the right place, you know, make use of being in the prayer room, you know, be around good company, you know, don't hang around bad company, don't be the bad company yourself, right? That people don't want to hang around with, you know, be the good company, but be around good people. It's always good groups and bad groups. And I'm not saying to create in groups and out groups, that's also negative. Don't be like that, you know, be inclusive, but I'm saying that be around good people, good-mannered people, be around good, good people. Uh, and then, uh, therefore now she's growing, and as she's growing, what's happening is that Zakaria sees her. And Allah in the Quran says, كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهِ زَكْرِ mihrab." Every time Zakri would come upon the, her sanctuary, he'd find provision. The scholars, they say, if it was the summer, he'd find the fruits of the winter. And if it was the winter, then the fruits of the summer. Miracles are happening. And he said, Maryam, where is this coming from? And she says, that's from Allah. And Allah's giving to whoever He pleases. And so miracles can stem from you. Your sense of growth can be a miracle into the world. And the number five, last one would be Zakaria. When he sees that, he makes a prayer to Allah because he had no children. And Allah gave him Yahya, John the Baptist, you know, Yahya alayhi salam. And so when he sees that, it's an inspiration. And aim to be an inspiration for the world around you. That other people see how hard you guys work. Let other people see your mannerism, your character. Let that be an inspiration for other people. Your nephews and nieces and your young siblings. Let them see how amazing you guys are in your, in your being studious and your being, uh, you know. Um, and I ask Allah. And then we spoke about a few last things about time and then taqwa and having an excellent character. It's been really wonderful spending this short time with you. And I ask Allah to accept from all of us and to... And to uh, and to bless all of you. Zakum al khairan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Zakum for coming up tonight. Um, there are, if you've noticed, there are like little questionnaires uh, in front of you. If you haven't filled them out already, could you please fill them out? Uh, we'll use information to help uh, sort of develop the Muslim Center further, inshallah. And if you just leave it uh, at the side, or you can have to be.